so today we talk about um, a preterm premature rupture of membranes, um, abbreviated as PPROM. A preterm premature rupture of membranes is a rupture of the membranes um, before the onset of labor and before um, before 37 weeks uh, gestation age. When membranes rupture uh, before 28 weeks in our setup, we call that uh, an inevitable abortion. Uh, after 28 weeks and up to before 37 weeks, that's what we are calling um, preterm uh, premature rupture of membranes. So that is the definition. So the next thing we have to look at is um, how do we make this um, diagnosis of um, a preterm premature rupture of membranes? So usually a woman comes uh, with a complaint of um, uh, passing fluid up uh, her vagina, and um, and sometimes they say they had a gush uh, of fluid uh, that they felt coming out. Um, then we have to suspect uh, a rupture of uh, membranes. There's so many other things, or let's say a few other things, uh, there are other differentials that um, can explain a woman coming uh, with um, a gush of fluid. It might be urine, so there might be urinary incontinence. It might be um, just excessive vaginal discharge uh, in pregnancy. And it can also uh, possibly um, be an infection. Sometimes a woman has candida and there's excessive discharge and they think that uh, the membranes have ruptured. So we have to take a comprehensive history and try to dig out which um, of these uh, possibilities uh, it is. Then we have to confirm the diagnosis. Um, we confirm this diagnosis using a gold standard <clears throat> examination, and this is um, sterile speculum. Um, fluid coming from the vaginal os, and we look at uh, fluid accumulating in the posterior phonics. So when we see uh, these two features, uh, we say that this, uh, we confirm a diagnosis of um, rupture of, uh, of membranes. Um, of course, when we are doing a sterile speculum exam, we are also uh, looking out for a cord prolapse because once um, a cord prolapses, one of the things that can happen is, um, uh, once the membranes rupture, one of the things that can happen is, um, is a cord prolapse. So those are the things that um, we are looking for. The other things that we can uh, do that might reinforce the diagnosis, if the diagnosis is in doubt, we can do ultrasound that uh, might show us a reduced cycle volume either by measuring the deepest pool or measuring the amniotic fluid um, index. The other uh, test that we can use um, is um, insulin-like growth factor binding protein, which is uh, one of the tests uh, people are using now, or uh, placental alpha microglobulin. These two tests uh, look for placental uh, proteins in the vaginal fluid, and therefore, if we find these uh, proteins there, then we assume that membranes have ruptured. Otherwise, where would placental proteins come from in the vaginal uh, fluid? These tests are very sensitive and they're very uh, specific. Um, the other tests that can be done to confirm um, rupture of membranes, which are no longer done and which are no longer advised, is the nitrazine tests, um, which changes uh, color to blue when uh, Lyco is present, but this has a um, like an, um, positive, um, um, it has a false positive, uh, it becomes false positive in cases of um, when there's semen in the vagina, when there's blood in the vagina, and uh, when the semen uh, or urine in the vagina. So all these things make uh, this test un unreliable. Uh, also, one test which was done historically is the fanning test, but that is no longer done. The gold standard for diagnosis of um, rupture of membranes is the speculum exam. If we do a sterile speculum exam and there's completely no um, liqua in our setup, then we assume that this woman has no a rupture of um, membranes. So that is how um, a diagnosis of rupture of membranes uh, is uh, is made. 
So after we make this diagnosis, how do we uh, manage uh, these patients? So we have to start by admitting uh, these patients. We normally admit these patients on the ward. Uh, we avoid as much as possible doing um, digital vaginal exams because they introduce infection, increase risk of um, infection for the baby, increase risk of infection for the mother reduced uh, latency period. The latency period is the period from the rupture of membranes to the start of labor. So if we do vaginal exams, this period is reduced and the woman will go in labor um, in a short time. So we have to avoid <coughs> uh, vaginal exams as much as uh, possible. Then um, the other thing we do is uh, we do the um, uh, baseline test. We do a full blood count um, just to check for um, uh, leukocytes in the full blood count. Um, the other thing that um, we can do, maybe do a vaginal swab, though it doesn't change much, uh, we can do a vaginal swab and check for any uh, bacteria that might um, explain the reason for uh, the rupture of membranes. Then we put these women on antibiotics. So we normally use erythromycin, uh, 500 milligrams, uh, anything between 250 and 500 milligrams, uh, uh, six hourly. And uh, we give this for 10 days. We give this for 10 days or up to the onset of labor, whichever occurs earlier. So antibiotics, again, increase the latency. They reduce the risk of chorioamnonitis. They reduce the risk of um, neonatal sepsis as well. So that's uh, the reason that we give antibiotics. The other thing we have to do is um, uh, give uh, dexamethasone. We give dexamethasone uh, to every patient that is below 34 weeks. We give 6 milligrams twice a day uh, times 4 doses. We know that um, <clears throat> uh, these, um, the dexamethasone uh, in, helps uh, lung maturation by improving uh, production of um, uh, surfactant. The other things dexamethasone does, of course, is reduces the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage, reduces the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis. That's, those are the, um, are the major issues. So we have to give those um, <clears throat> drugs. The other thing we can give uh, in terms of drugs is uh, magnesium sulfate. If a woman is below 30 weeks, <coughs> We can give magnesium sulfate for um, neuroprotection. So this is something that we don't normally practice, but uh, it's something that is being done out there. We give magnesium sulfate um, and um, it will help reduce the risk of cerebral palsy in these patients and any neuromuscular um, uh, disorders. So that's about uh, magnesium sulfate. Then lastly, we can give um, a tocolytic. If a woman comes with rupture of membranes uh, uh, pre-term, prematurely, then uh, if labor started uh, and there's no evidence of any chorioamnonitis, we can give um, a tocolytic to help uh, slow down the labor, to give a time for dexamethasone uh, to take its full uh, full effect. In the scoriamnonitis, there's no need to delay uh, labor uh, to give um, a steroid. So that's about the drug uh, management for, uh, for these patients. Then the next thing is delivery. When do we deliver uh, these patients? So we deliver these uh, mothers when... Um, they reach uh, 34 completed weeks, and there's a lot of change in that aspect. Uh, the change is that we have to individualize the, um, the delivery point of our women. We shouldn't have a blanket statement that everyone who reaches 34 weeks uh, gets to be delivered because we know uh, the morbidity that is associated with prematurity all over the world. Um, so we need to individualize and see that... Um, uh, 34 weeks is the first point, but we can stretch this uh, period to as long as 37 weeks if we see that there's no onset of infection, there's nothing, um, the mother is okay, the baby is okay. We can prolong this period even up to 37 weeks. So that's about the delivery point. If 
Corium Nonitis does not set in. If Corium Nonitis sets in, then we have to deliver at the point we make uh, that diagnosis of Corium Nonitis. <clears throat> so what do we use uh, to make a diagnosis of Corium Nonitis? So we have to have some surveillance as the woman is staying on the ward for looking out for Corium Nonitis. So we look at um, temperature of the patient. We look at the pulse. We look at the pad. Um, is the lycra discolored? Is it foul smelling? We look at the woman's complaint of abdominal or new onset of abdominal pain, abdominal tenderness or uh, uterine irritability. All that uh, we are looking out for uh, to check for choreomnonitis. Uh, fetal tachycardia is something that we are looking out for. We can use a C-reactive protein. Um, if it increases, then there might be infection. We can look at our full blood count and look at our leukocyte count to check if um, there's infection. What is important about all these parameters we are using to look for choreomnonitis is none of them should be used in isolation as evidence of choreomnonitis. We need to put all the information that we have together and decide if uh, this woman indeed has choreomnonitis. And if they have choreomnonitis, then they have to be delivered um, uh, preferably vaginally. So what is the mode of delivery that is um, advisable for these patients with preterm premature rupture of membranes? So the mode of delivery is... Um, vaginal normally. So we induce labor, we monitor labor, we monitor for variable decelerations, which are evidence of um, cord compression because these patients usually would have uh, an oligoidramnios. So we are monitoring for any fetal distress because of that. Then um, the other thing we are we are avoiding, of course, especially in patients with uh, choreomnonitis is um, C-section. So we want patients who have develop choreomnonitis to develop vaginally because they will end up with complications if they have already choreomnonitis and they end up uh, delivering by uh, C-sections. The other uh, patients who might need to deliver for C-section by C-section are those patients who have contraindications for vaginal delivery. Otherwise, these patients end up um, with induction and vaginal delivery if labor does not set in uh, from diagnosis. So usually the median uh, time for labor to set in after a diagnosis of PPROM is seven days. Within seven days, most patients have uh, the labor started and then 50% uh, a week after that. So usually that's the, um, the way these patients um, end up uh, delivering. So um, it means that lastly, we have to cancel these patients because some of them are going to stay on the ward for a long time and they need to know that uh, when we are going to deliver them, they need to know the complications of um, of PPROM, which is usually sepsis for the baby, choreomnonitis, um, um, and also when there's oligohydramnios, there might be uh, lung hypoplasia, uh, then um, if the problem has been there uh, for a long time, even musculoskeletal uh, disorders and uh, deformities. So these patients need to know that they need to know the end point for their delivery and they need to know uh, the prognosis for the babies depending on the uh, time uh, that they, they deliver. Uh, we know in our setup, most babies born one kg and below uh, will not survive. So that is um, something we have to discuss uh, with uh, the mother. Um, then we have to involve the neonatologist in the management of these patients. Even though, like we know in our setup, really we have very, very few neonatologists and pediatricians and are usually... We have to make do with whatever human resource we have in our setup, our midwives, uh, senior house officers, and whoever is available uh, to help manage these um, uh, babies which are usually uh, delivered uh, preterm. So that was the presentation on preterm premature rupture of membranes, and uh, we will see you in the next uh, in the next one. Thank you for listening.